This morning's topic is, what did Jesus say about diet and health? And you might stop and you might think, well, I know he might have made a couple of comments about it, but I'm not sure that there's a whole lot about diet and health. And the thing is, today, if we look back and we look at medical history, we'll find that there have been warnings sounded about certain parts of health. We have cholesterol warnings, warnings about smoking, warnings about stress, warnings about obesity, warnings about alcohol abuse. All of these things, doctors and experts and any of us would agree that these things have an effect on our life. At one time in my life, there was a time that I had to take my doctor told me, you have to take cholesterol medicine. You have high cholesterol, he said. I didn't want to do that because with every medication you take, no matter what it is, there's a side effect. But because my doctor told me to do it and because my cholesterol was very high, I took it and it brought it down. And then what I asked him, I said, well, what can I do if I don't want to take the medication? So with my doctor's advice, he said, you can change your diet. That's what he said to me. You can change your diet, and that will, that will likely help. And I did. I changed my diet, and it made a big difference. What was the diet that I did? The biblical diet. We're going to talk about that today. You see, hospitals and psychiatric institutions are packed with people who ignore the warnings that are given about what we eat, what we, do people smoke, what do you drink, how much do you eat? All of these things affect our lives. The air that we breathe, they have an effect on you. And believe it or not, some people find it hard to believe, God does care about how you treat your body. And within the Bible, he's giving us a manual to go by. We have a manual right here in God's Word. And today what we're going to do is we're going to use the Bible to answer questions that people often ask about health. Does the Bible speak about health? Does it speak about the things that we should eat, the things that we should do, how we should treat our bodies? Well, let's begin. We're going to do this just the same as we have done it in the past. Now, before I want to say this, there are a few things that men in particular, being a man, I can speak with authority on this. There are a few things that men in particular never like to be told. And one of them is I don't like to be told how to use my money. I don't like to be told how to use my time. And I don't like to be told what I should eat or drink, right? A man likes to do what a man likes to do. But you know, God has guidelines. And he tells us, what we, he tells us how to treat our money. He tells us how to spend at least one particular day of our time. He says, six you work, one you rest. We covered that last night. And he also speaks about the things that we should be participating in as far as eat and drink and health. So let's begin by asking the first questions. Are health principles really addressed in the Bible? I've had people ask this a number of times. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So the fact is the Bible rates health, health right up there with everything else. It's, it's right in the list of importance with the other things that we've been discussing. Our mind, our spirituality, all of these things are interrelated and interdependent. And what affects one affects the other. Have you ever heard the saying, I grew up with this, I remember when I was in elementary school, I had a teacher say to me, uh, it was actually my first grade teacher, Miss Kafer, I remember Miss Kafer, and she would say, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. And I, I remember as a first grader, I thought, that's so silly. If I eat a banana, do I become a banana? And, you know, I didn't get the sense of it. And what she was saying is, if you eat healthy, you will be healthy. If you eat unhealthy, you will be unhealthy. If our bodies are misused, it affects our brain. It affects our spirituality. And we can't become what God created us to be if we're eating things that are not good for us. And today we live in a world of processed foods and chemicals and all of these things that are unhealthy for us. So we have to be careful. You know, I'm a label reader. I look at what's in the, the food before I put it into my mouth. When I go grocery shopping, I look at the label. I want to see what's in it. We're wise to do that, to observe those things. Next question. 
Why does God give health laws to his people? And you say, health laws? Really? Well, let's take a look at a few things. Deuteronomy 6.24. This is from the modern King James. And Jehovah commanded us to do all these statutes for our good always, that he might preserve us alive. God gives us health rules and laws because he knows what's best for the human body. He created us. He knows what we should and shouldn't do. He knows what's good for us and what's bad for us. It's kind of like an automobile manufacturer. You know, if you have a car, chances are in your glove box is an operations manual. It tells you how to service the car. It tells you what kind of fuel and oil to put in the car. And if you go against those recommendations, chances are that car is not going to last and give you the service that it could. Our body is no different. If I go against God's health laws, I can't live as healthy as I could if I follow the things that God tells me. Plus, I'm disobeying God if I'm not following his manual, which is his word. Next verse, Exodus 23, 25, and you shall serve Jehovah your God, and he shall bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. God, who created us, provides us the information that we need right here. It's called the Bible. And ignoring what the Bible says results in premature disease. It results in twisted thinking. It results in burned out lives, working too much, not resting when God says we should, just like abusing that car and going against the manufacturer's counsel. It results in serious car trouble. If I neglect to change the oil, if I neglect to service the transmission, that car will not last as long and give me the service that I expect it to give. So following God's rules for better health and more abundant life is extremely important. And these laws serve as a protection for us. It's not a restriction. God didn't give us the Sabbath to restrict us from work. He gave us the Sabbath for our health so that we can rest, so that we can come back to the work the next day and continue on. It restores us. So what we eat is just as important as these other things. But let's be more specific. What do God's health laws have to say about the things we eat? Is it specific? Well, Isaiah 55, 2, it says, Listen careful to me and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Next verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So everything we do in our lives should be for the glory of God. If we claim to be a Christian, we'll even eat and drink differently than all the other people do because we're doing it to the glory of God, using that which is good. If God says something is not fit to eat, then he must have a good reason for it. Please, think about that. If God puts in his word that there's something we should not eat, then it should be observed by those who are reading God's word. He's not a harsh dictator. God is a loving father. A caring or loving father or mother does not give their child something that they think is going to harm them. They go through pains to keep their children out of harm's way. So all of God's counsel, all of it, is for our good, and it's for our good always. Remember, God doesn't change. And the Bible makes this promise on the PowerPoint, Psalm 8411, no good thing will be withheld from those who walk uprightly. So if God withholds something from us, it's because it's not good for us. Does that make sense? If God withholds something from us, it's because it is not good for us. Next question we want to ask, what did God give people to eat when he created them and provided a perfect diet? Well, remember we talked about the foundational beliefs all come from Genesis. So when we go back and we look, this is at the creation account, Genesis 1.29. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. So the original diet for Adam and Eve, the original diet for humanity that God gave people in the beginning was fruit, grains, and nuts. And vegetables were added a little bit later. 
And we look here in Genesis 3.18. It says, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. So in the Bible, it's clear that the diet prescribed for Adam and Eve was a vegetarian diet. That's what he prescribed for them. And you might say, well, this doesn't make any sense because people eat meat today. Well, we'll, we'll discover that as we, as we go through this. Next slide, it says, are there items that are specifically mentioned by God as being unclean or forbidden? Well, let's open our Bible, and a lot of people balk at this, and they sigh when we go here, but we're going to read it. We're going to read this whole text. We're going to turn our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 11, and I, I get this often. People will either turn off at this point or tune out, but let's just see what God's Word says, and people will say, well, that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament. All that stuff's in the Old Testament. The New Testament changes everything. Well, we're going to see today if that's really true. That's what we're here for. We're here to see what God wants, not what I want, not what we want as individuals, but what God wants. Leviticus chapter 11. There's a Bible in the pew if you don't have one. And remember, I want you to remember this. We say this often here. Jesus never, not once, did Jesus quote the New Testament. He only quoted the Old Testament. That's all he quoted. The New Testament didn't exist when Jesus was walking on the earth. The New Testament came about after Jesus had ascended to heaven. So, let's, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me, right? And remember, God inspired men to write both the Old and the New Testaments. So we can't disregard either one. We have to take the whole Bible, all of it. Leviticus 11, beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord, that's Jehovah, spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among the animals that are on the earth. So we see that Adam and Eve had a vegetarian diet, but God is saying you can eat these particular animals. He says, Among the animals that divides the hoof, having cloving hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean for you. The rock hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, or the rabbit in other words, because it chews the cud but is, does not have a cloven hoof, is unclean to you. And the swine, that would be the pig, the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet it does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. These you may eat of all that are in the water, whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers that you may eat. You may eat those things, in other words. Verse 10. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. Verse 11. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. And these things you shall regard as an abomination among the birds that shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, and the falcon after its kind. Every raven after its kind. The ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, the, the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, the, and the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw and the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron after its kind, the hoopoe and the bat. All flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you. Yet these you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth, these you may eat. The locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, 
the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. By these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries part of the carcass or any of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. The carcass of any animal which divides the foot but is not cloven hoofed or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches it shall be unclean. And whoever goes on its paw, whatever goes on its paws among all kinds of animals that go on all fours, these are unclean to you. Whoever touches any such carcass shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It is unclean to you. These also shall be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth. The mole, the mouse, the large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean till evening. Verse 32. Anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean, whether it is any item of wood or clothing or skin or sack, whatever item it is in which any work is done, it must be put in, a wa put in water and it shall be unclean until evening. Then it shall be clean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, you shall break, and whatever is in it shall be unclean. In such a vessel, any edible food upon which water falls becomes unclean, and any drink that may be drunk from it becomes unclean. And everything on which a part of any such carcass falls shall be unclean, whether it is in an oven or a cooking stove. It shall be broken down, for they are unclean and, you sh and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which there is plenty of water shall be clean, but whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. And if part of any such carcass falls on any planting seed which is to be sown, it remains clean. But if water is put on the seed, and if part of any such carcass falls on it, it becomes unclean to you. If any animal which you eat, may eat dies, he who touches its carcass shall be unclean until evening." If he, he who eats of its carcass shall, be, shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. He who carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, whatever has many feet among the creeping things that creep on the earth, these you shall not eat for they are an abomination. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled. For I am Jehovah your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves from, with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am Jehovah who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, you shall therefore be holy as I am holy. This is the law of the animals and birds of every creeping, of every creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the unclean and the clean and between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. Now, many people, I know that's a lot of reading, isn't it? And many people look at this and they say, well, this was for the Jews. This was for the Israelites. Well, is the digestive system of a Jew any different than mine or yours? My belly isn't different from a Jew. It might be a little bigger than a Jew's, but my belly isn't any different. My digestive system isn't any different. And some people will say, well, this was because they were a roving people. They were a rambling people, and this was to cut down on disease. This is God's law. If you're following what God says, he says what's, what he says is an abomination what do I, can I do to make it not an abomination? If God says it's unclean, well, that's okay. He says it's unclean. That was only for them. It's clean for me. That's like saying the commandments were only for the Jews. No, the commandments are for everyone. These laws apply. But let's continue. Don't lose me yet. 
Don't shut me off yet. Deuteronomy chapter 14, we can continue there. Deuteronomy 14. We're not going to read all of this, uh, but we are going to read some of this. I'm going to just read uh, several verses here. Deuteronomy 14, verses 1 through 20. You are the children of Jehovah your God. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. For you are a holy people to Jehovah your God. And Jehovah has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now, I want to stop there. Now, we say here, well, he was speaking to the Jews. But are Christians not a special people? Did God not choose you? Aren't you a son or a daughter of God? And, you know, we've talked about that in the past. Galatians tells us if we are Christ's, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So I can't disregard this. So let's keep going, though. Verse 3, you shall not eat any detestable thing. There are, there, these are the animals which you may eat. The ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the mountain goat, the antelope, the mountain sheep, and you may eat every animal with cloven hooves, having the hoof split in two parts, and that chews the cud among the animals. Nevertheless, of those that chew the cud or have cloven hooves, you may not eat such as these, the camel, the hare, the rock hyrax, for they chew the cud but do not have cloven hooves. They are unclean for you. Also the swine is unclean for you because it has cloven hooves and does not chew the cud, and you shall not eat their flesh nor touch their carcasses. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat all that have fins and scales. And whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean for you. All clean birds you may eat, but these you shall not eat. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the red kite, the falcon, and the kite after their kinds. Every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-haired owl, the seagull, the, the hawk after its kinds, the little owl, the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the fisher owl, the stork, the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe and the bat. Also, every creeping thing that flies is unclean for you. They shall not be eaten. You may eat clean birds. You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to an alien who is within your gates, that he may eat it, or may sell it to a foreigner. But you are a holy people to Jehovah your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, if you're going to give something that dies to someone else, it had to be something that was clean. You would not give something unclean to someone else. God is very clear. He doesn't want people doing this. So, this brings up a lot of questions, and I know there's a lot of objections rolling around in your head. There's a lot of verses that you think say something otherwise, but we're going to, we're going to look at those verses today. So let's, here's the next question. What animals are specifically mentioned by God as being unclean and forbidden? For review, we see it here, biblically unclean. All animals which do not have a split hoof and chew the cud. They have to have both, a split hoof and chew the cud. It was very specific in both accounts. And all fish and water creatures that do not have both fins and scales, they have to have both. This is what God says. This isn't what Mark's standing up here saying. This we read from the Bible. Do I believe the Bible or not? Do I believe it was inspired or not? Do I believe it was written for a particular person or a particular group of people? The Bible is for all people and those who want to follow what God says. Next, biblically unclean, all birds of prey, carrion eaters, and fish eaters. Leviticus 11, 13 through 20. Most creeping things or invertebrates are also unclean. Many animals, birds, and water creatures uh, people ordinary eat are, ordinarily eat are clean. Many of them are, but there are some exceptions. According to God's word, we've read we should only eat the following or we should not eat the following, rather. These are things that God lists that we should not eat. Pigs, squirrels, rabbits, catfish, eels, lobsters, clams, crabs, shrimp, oysters, frogs, and there's many others. Remember, fish have to have fins 
end scales. And I know for you people that have grown up in coastal areas or you like your, your lobsters and you like your crawdads and you like your crabs and you like your shrimp and your clams, and you're probably saying, oh, this can't be right. You know, there's a text in the Bible that talks about how man will serve his belly. At the outset, I said there's three things that a man doesn't like to be told, and this is one of them. Most people don't like to be told, well, you can't eat that. We're going to continue because we're, going to, we're coming back to some of these thoughts. Next question, but I like pork. Will God destroy me if I eat it? Well, what's the Bible say? Well, let's take a look. Isaiah 66, 15 through 17. For behold, Jehovah will come with fire, and by his sword will Jehovah plead with all flesh. For the slain of Jehovah will be many. They shall sanctify themselves and purify themselves, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together. Did you catch that? This is, a, this is what the Bible says. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves, eating swine flesh and the abomination in the mouth, shall be consumed. This might be shocking, but we have to talk about it. The Bible clearly states that all who eat swine's flesh, the mouse, or any other unclean thing, which are abominations, we read that, how many times do we see that? in the, in the uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. They will be destroyed with fire at the coming of Jesus Christ. So when God says to leave something alone and not eat it, shouldn't we obey that? Shouldn't we follow the manual that we have? The next question, but didn't this law of clean and unclean animals originate at Sinai? Isn't this right here what we just read in Leviticus is that where it started? Wasn't this only for the Jews? Didn't it end at the cross? And I hope you're paying attention to this. This question has to be addressed. Was this law only for, of clean and unclean animals, only for the Jews? And that's the argument that most pastors, most ministers, most people that I know that are Christian, they'll say, that was for the Jews. And I know that's what many of you are thinking. But I like to ask a question. When Noah was was bringing the animals to the ark. When God brought the animals to the ark and Noah was loading them, how many of each kind of animal did Noah put on the ark? I heard somebody say two. I heard somebody say it depends. Well, when I was growing up in school, we used to sing a song, Noah led the ark two by two. And I don't remember the tune, but I remember we used to sing that. Well, look at what the Bible says. I'm going to show you a verse that the vast majority of us have never seen because we don't read what the Bible says. Take a look at Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, Then Jehovah said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you how many? Seven. Seven. I'm glad somebody's paying attention. You shall take with you seven each of every, what? Clean. clean animal. A male and his female. How many of the unclean? Two of the unclean animals. A male and his female. Why is it we only remember the unclean part? Why do we not recognize that he says, you take seven of the clean animals, only two of the unclean? You know, whenever I talk, whenever I show people this verse, that they, their jaw drops. So it continues there. There we go. Seven each of every clean animal, and we see two, a male and its female, and then we see two each of every one that is unclean. This is very significant. Why? Why is this so significant? The flood took place in about 2370 BC. That's what most scholars would agree with. And the exodus from Egypt, when this was written, when we read in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, was written about 1513 BC. So this was, a, what Noah was experienced was over 850 years before this was written. And Noah knew the difference between clean and unclean animals. How did he know the difference? God told him. It was established in Genesis. It was, it was established in Genesis, the difference between clean and unclean. 
Take a look here in Genesis 8.20. It says, Then Noah built an altar to Jehovah and took of every, what kind of bird? Clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. You see, Noah's sacrifice of clean animals also shows that he understood the difference between clean and unclean. It wasn't just that God brought them. Noah knew the difference. In fact, Adam had to know the difference. And you say, Adam had to know the difference. How is that? Well, we have a Bible example in Adam that he had to make sacrifices. In, the, in Genesis, in the first few chapters of Genesis, you see that there was a sacrifice made. If you took a pig to the altar and said, I'm sacrificing this to God, what do you think would happen? You would lose your life. You would lose your life. So when, I, when they go to the Jewish temple, to the temple of God, when people come to the temple of God, if they were going to bring an unclean animal and sacrifice it to God, God would reject them. They could be destroyed for that. Isn't this the temple of God, the body? If the body is the temple of God, who am I to put something in it that's unclean that he disapproves of? And we justify it. And I know you're thinking of texts in the New Testament. Please don't run ahead of me. Please pay attention to the words that are here. And we're going to get to those. I promise you, we will get to them. We will get to those things. The Bible has ample evidence that there were clean and unclean animals from the very dawn of creation. Noah lived long before any Jew existed, but he knew the difference between clean and unclean. Adam knew the difference between clean and unclean. Cain and Abel even knew the difference between clean and unclean. The truth is the death of Christ had no altering effect whatsoever on the laws that God has given us in the Bible. The Bible says that all who break them will be destroyed when Jesus returns. And many like to say that Isaiah 66, 15 through 17 is for the Jews. But the context of Isaiah 66 through 17 is the new world. It's the new world. That's the context. And as I mentioned before, the digestive system of Noah or of those Jews wasn't any different than ours. In fact, we are spiritual Jews. You know, I've had people make this argument. They say, well, again, they were, they were nomadic people. They were wandering in the wilderness, and they, God didn't want them to get disease. So after Jesus died, you know, uh, now, now we, have, we have refrigeration now, so we don't have to worry about it. You know, we don't worry about those diseases because we know to cook it out and we have refrigeration. Well, what do we do for the 1,900 years between the time of Jesus and now? What did all those people do before 19, about 1903 when the first refrigerator was coming out? What did they do? So we can change the law for the past 120 years because now we have refrigeration. We don't have to listen to God anymore. I've even had people make the argument, remember, fish have to have both fins and scales. And they've made the argument, well, you know, the, the catfish today are, are, are farm-raised and they can't get to the bottom. Oh, okay, so... God says it in his word, I can alter it. It's no different than altering the Sabbath to Sunday. It's no different. If I'm going to take God's law, if I'm going to take what he says I can or can't eat and say, well, I'm going to fix this to where I can eat it, that's like taking the day that God made holy and say, well, I'm going to fix it to where I can, I can keep the day that I want. How's it any different? How's it any different? This gets me worked up because I didn't learn this in my church. I didn't learn this from the people that I was listening to. I had to study the Bible. And when I woke up about the Sabbath truth and I started reading what the Bible actually said, this is what woke me up to say, God does care what I eat. God does have a diet for me. He does have a way he wants me to live. And it does matter what I put into my body. My body is the temple of God. That's what we're told in the Bible. So why would I put anything that he calls an abomination Anything that he calls defiling, unclean. I don't want to have to, anything to do with anything unclean. Next question. In Matthew 15, 11, Didn't Jesus say not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man? This is the go-to verse. This is one of them. So let's look at this. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, and let's see what Jesus said about diet in Matthew chapter 15. Let's have a look at this. Matthew chapter 15, and 
I'm going to start in verse 1. We have to know the context. See, I can, I can remember we talked about that cherry-picked Bible. I can pull any verse out of the Bible and apply it to any way I want. But if I read it in context, it can change everything. So please, I'm asking you to open your Bible and follow along as we read this. This is so important because so many people, just, they just want to see the verse they want to see. They don't want to see what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 15. Then the scribes, this is verse 1, then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. This is important. This question is the crux of the matter. So what's the context? Washing of hands. And you'll see this as we go through. Why do your disciples, trans verse 2 again, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? He answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother. And he who causes father or mother, or he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then, the, then, the need not, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Here's the verse. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. People will read that verse and close their Bibles and say, I've seen enough. He continue, then it continues. Then his disciples came to him. Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he, that's Jesus, answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter, we're going to read about him in a little bit. Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Was Jesus talking about food? No. No. The context begins in chapter 15, verse 2. That they were upset. They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And Jesus is saying, that doesn't defile them. Not washing their hands doesn't defile them. You see, the Jews had this ritual of they would, they would ceremonial wash. They, would, they might even get dirt off the ground and pretend like they were washing their hands. Jesus knew this. And he knew that they weren't really washing their hands. They weren't even talking about diet. It doesn't mention anything about clean or unclean animals here. Why do we take that? You know why? Because I like my shrimp. I like my lobsters. Really? That's what one of my good friends said to me. That I said, look, read it in context. He read it. He says, I like my food. I'm going to eat it. That's what I want to do. Okay. Nice knowing you in this world, brother. That's what I said to him. He's a good friend of mine. And he thought it was funny. But I hope it sinks in. I hope it sinks in. We read that God will destroy those who are eating unclean things. In the context of Matthew chapter 15... I could pluck that verse out and make this cherry-picked Bible say whatever I want it to say. But he was not talking about food. He was talking about the washing of hands. 
clean or unclean meats never even came up here. And if we want to twist that into he's saying you can eat whatever you want, we're sadly mistaken. We're taking the Bible and twisting Jesus' words into something that he did not say. Next question. In Matthew 15, 11, didn't it say and not what goes into the mouth of the files of man, but what comes out? I just covered all this. We looked at this, so I'm not going to go through those slides because I just covered them without, I forgot I'd put them in the PowerPoint. See, there's that text, 1520, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So we know the context. Next slide. But didn't Jesus cleanse all animals in Peter's vision as recorded in Acts 10? Oh, uh, let's turn there too. Let's go to Acts chapter 10 and see what it says. I know this thing, folks. This, this takes, you know, um, you, a man's belly is his God. And if that's the case, I don't like being told what I can and can't eat. But let me tell you something. When God tells me I can or can't eat it, I'm going to follow it. I'm going to follow it. Because I grew up in my early years, in my very young years, I grew up in Baltimore. That's where I was born, which is a coastal city. And they are known for crabbing in Baltimore. Crabs and oysters and clams. Oysters and crabs, mostly. And growing up all of my life, that I ate those things and I loved them. They were, they were so tasty to me. I mean, I, and now when I think about it, I think, you know, what do crabs eat? Have you ever been to the Chesapeake Bay? Have you ever been to Baltimore and seen the water? Have you ever seen how nasty it is? Do you know what the crabs eat? All the garbage off the floor. They eat everything that's on the bottom of the ocean. And you know what sinks to the bottom when the fish do their little business? That's what the crabs are eating. That's what they're eating. And I was eating that garbage. I always wondered why. You know, when I would feel bloated. I would feel, it was like my fingers were fat. They felt like sausages. Basically, they were. You are what you eat, right? <laughs> if I eat a pig, I'm a pig. <laughs> So let's, let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. And we're going to read this in its context. We're going to read the whole chapter. because There's a lot of information here. And remember, Peter was the one that was asking Jesus the question, too, that we read about just a moment ago. Explain this parable to us. So Peter had a clear understanding at that point. So here we go. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, that's about 3 p.m., he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Verse 7. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two sons of his household servants, a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is noon. So it's about lunchtime. Keep that in mind. So he goes up to pray about the sixth hour. Verse 10. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened up and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Who's speaking there? Who's speaking? In my Bible, it's in red letters. It could be Jesus speaking to him, right? Right? But Peter said, not so, Lord. This, it says, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again, saying a second time, or again, uh, again, the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Okay, we're done. 
That's all I needed to see. See, we do the same thing with that verse that we've done with what we saw in Matthew. But he says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. So, verse 16. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven. This is significant. This is significant. This was done three times. Verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this what this vision which he had seen meant. Ah, he wondered what it meant. In other words, he knew nothing of unclean's ever gone into my mouth. He knew he wasn't supposed to do this. It has to mean something, right? It has to mean something. He can't be telling me to eat what he's called unclean. So again, now while Peter wondered within himself, verse 17, what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, The men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, how many? Three men are seeking you. How many times did that sheet come down out of heaven? Three times. This is significant. Verse 20. Arise. You notice, back up there, back up to verse 13. It says, and a voice came to him, rise, Peter. Here in verse 20, arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Verse 21, then Peter went out to the men who had been seen to him, sent to him from Cornelius and said, yes, I am him, he who you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, who was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Verse 24. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation? But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent. For I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. And, and said, rather, your, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send, therefore, to Joppa. Didn't we just read this? You see, he's recounting. He's telling the account. So he, he continues. Verse 32, send, therefore, to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent up to you, sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God has sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus, he is Lord of all, that the word, that that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and evil, or, or, I'm sorry, doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I want you to notice, Peter opens his mouth and he says, God shows no partiality. 
He says in verse 33, and every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness, is accepted by him. Remember before, do you know how unlawful it is? It's wrong for a Jew to have anything to do. No, Peter's dream, he saw that it was okay that the Gentiles have to be grafted in, that they are part of God. God's not partial. He's not partial. Verse 39, we and we are witnesses of all things which he, that's Jesus, did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him, that's Jesus, God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him, whoever, it says, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because of the gift of the Holy, I'm sorry, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. It wasn't just on the Jews, it was on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Now this account continues. He recounts it again in chapter 11. And he talks about this dream. He was told, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, I'm not going to eat anything unclean. And he says, stop calling unclean what I have cleansed. He's not talking about food. Nowhere in here does it talk about diet. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's saying, look, don't call these people unclean. They've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. So long as they accept Christ Jesus. You see, the Jewish nation wouldn't do the will of God. They wanted to keep everything in their own belief structure. They did not want to preach the gospel that Christ was sharing with them. They, the, the, everything was, they were keeping it here. And God says, you need to spread this message. Well, this is what Paul was doing. Paul and Peter were, and Barnabas and all of those disciples were spreading the gospel. And they took it to the world. And that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. So again... Acts chapter 10, 11, and 12 has nothing to do with food, but people will use this to say, God has cleansed all things so I can eat whatever I want. It's just, it's just amazing to me how we, we grab onto things. I've done it, friends. I've been there. I've, I've tried it. You know, if God's food laws change when Jesus died, why would Peter be wondering what the dream meant? Why would he wonder? Some say it's confusing, but it's not. If we know what the rest of the Bible says, then we know what God permits and what he doesn't permit. So, another text people are confused about is right here. 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. They'll pull this out. Every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused. And they pull this verse out and they say, here. Well, let's look at it in context. See, isn't it amazing how when we take these cherry-picked verses and we start looking at what the text says, it changes everything. Let's start here. I'm going to put it on the PowerPoint, or you can follow along in your Bible if you want. 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The text continues, the next verse. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. I want to stop there. Just pause here for a moment. Notice what it says. Commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving for the, by those who believe and know the truth. 
Keep going. Verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. And that's where people stop. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So people look at this and they say, that means that if I pray over it, it doesn't matter. I can eat whatever I want. We're missing the point. We're missing the point. It's by those who believe and know the truth. What's the truth of God's word? What does it tell me throughout the Bible? It says, stay away from these things. Don't eat these things. How would I eat anything? I'm never going to eat anything unclean, Lord. Nothing unclean's ever gone into my mouth, Peter said. And then here, it's by those who believe and know the truth. We know, we've been instructed what we should and shouldn't eat. So when it says those things which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth, for every creature of God, that's all of those things that he created that we could eat. Nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. It is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, this text is interesting. Well, I'm not going to go into the other things about forbidding to marry and those things. That there's a specific reason that that was said, and that applies to a certain thing. We're not going to go into that now. But verse 5 tells us that these animals or foods are acceptable to God. That's, that's what we're told. You know, when we look at these things, they're sanctified by God's word, by prayer of blessing, which is offered before the meal. It doesn't make the food acceptable if God calls it unclean. Would God sanctify anything that he's called unclean? If he calls something an abomination, does he make it holy later? Does he say, well, it was abomination then, but it's not now. It's not anymore. If we really believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, how could he have these laws change and flip-flop? So the next question. What did God make the hog for, the pig for, if not to eat? What did, what did he make them for? Well, keep in mind that originally God did not create animals to be eaten. We saw that in the Bible. Meat came as a result of, actually, meat wasn't introduced to man's diet until the flood of Noah's day. That's when they were permitted to eat meat. And they knew and understood that it had to be the clean variety because Noah knew the difference between a clean sacrifice and an unclean animal. And God made the hog for the same purpose. He made the buzzard and the scavengers to clean up the garbage. You know, God has, if we leave this earth alone, it, it replenishes itself. That's the way he, he created it, to take care of itself. And if we let the animals do what they're supposed to do, they will, you know, if, a, if an animal dies, if you see an animal dead on the road, what happens? The birds come and take care of that for you. I don't want to eat those birds who are eating that animal. And that's what God says in the Bible. Don't eat those birds who eat those animals. Next question. Does the Bible condemn overeating? I know there's more verses, friends, that we could look at. There's a lot more. I want to say this before we move on to the overeating part. A lot of people will also go to Romans chapter 14. And they try to read Romans 14 and justify a non-biblical diet by reading Romans 14. I gave a lecture called Understanding Romans 14. And I'm going to ask you, whether you're on the fence or not, if you believe this, whether you believe this message or not, or you're still in doubt, watch that video and see what, what's said in that sermon because it's a long sermon, I'm going to tell you, because I go through this as well. But we examine Romans 14 carefully and we look at every sentence in there and we read it and you're going to be surprised at what people say it says and what it does not say they say. Does that make sense? People say it says certain things which it does not. Just like they say Jesus said it was okay. It's not what goes into the mouth, but what, 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 what comes out that defiles a man. He was speaking about diet. That's what they say. But we found today he wasn't. Read Romans 14. Listen to the lecture I gave on Romans 14 where we break it down. I'm going to ask you to do that because it's, it's very telling and a lot of people don't want to see it because it holds them accountable. You know, God's word holds us accountable. When I read these things, I have to make changes. I know somebody that was living with someone, and when they found out that God didn't permit adultery, they separated. They moved out. They, they stopped those relations. They did things according to God's word. That's not always easy, friends. It's not easy to make these changes. So, 
Does the Bible condemn overeating? Boy, am I guilty of that. Let's take a look. Proverbs 23, 2. Don't go, this is the contemporary English version, don't go and stuff yourself. That would be just the same as cutting your throat. That's a contemporary English version. Now, another translation says it this way. And thou hast put a knife to thy throat if thou art a man of appetite. Overeating is responsible for many of the diseases that are caused today. Diet and health, these things are very important to our Heavenly Father. They're very important to our Lord Jesus Christ. Next question. Do you really think that what we eat matters to God? I had somebody ask me one time, look, this, this was how it was posed to me. You know, we worship a God that's uh, just, this God knows everything. And this God is a loving God. Do you really think that God's going to destroy me because I choose to eat a little pork or a little shrimp or a little lobster? Does it really make a difference? Is God that petty? That's what they asked me. You know what I said to him? Did it make a difference in the Garden of Eden, what they ate? Did what they eat cost them their life? Has God changed? So I put this slide. It mattered in the Garden of Eden. Why would it matter then, but it doesn't matter now? God said, you can eat this, but this one you cannot. He tells us in the Bible, you can eat this, but this you cannot. But we insist, oh boy, that serpent makes that food look so good. It's appealing to the eyes. It's appealing to my inner man. I, I want to feed that belly. You see, that's the problem. That's the problem. Did it matter in the Garden of Eden? We don't like thinking about that because, well, now, boy, I got all this stuff in my freezer, and, you know, all this unclean meat. I've got this hog that we had slaughtered last year, and it's in the, in the cooler. What do I do with it? Well, you know what? I'm not going to eat that. I'll just give it to my friends. What? Are you kidding me? You find out that you've got drugs in your cabinet that, that are killer drugs, and, and if you take it, they find out it's, it's laced with something that even if you take a small dose, it'll kill you. Well, I'm not going to take this. I'll just give it to my friend. What's the difference? Throw it away. Destroy it. Just like in the book of Acts, when they found out that the books that they had were against God, what did they do? They didn't give them to other people. They didn't sell them. They took these valuable books and they burned them because it was displeasing to God. You don't finish it up. You don't give it to somebody else. You get rid of it. It would be like somebody finding out that pornography was bad, and they say, well, I'll just give this to my son. I don't need it anymore. I'm just going to get it out of my... Isn't that... It sounds ridiculous, but I have to use those illustrations to make it hit home sometimes. So, next question. Does the Bible condemn the use of tobacco? Does it? Well, the fact is, the Bible doesn't mention, it doesn't come out and directly say that smoking is wrong. You know, we can, we can find several biblical reasons why the use of tobacco would certainly displease God. You know, we want to be honest, and we want to know what God's Word says. So, take a look at these things. <clears throat> these are just four points that we make on the screen. The use of tobacco injures health, and it, it defiles the body. I don't know any person that smokes that says, no, I'm glad I started smoking. Most people who smoke say, boy, I wish I hadn't started. I wish. It's so hard. It's addictive. It controls you. And, and oh, eating controls you. It's no different. What I put into my body, whether I eat things that God says that I shouldn't eat, or if I'm inhaling things that God says is harmful to my body, or that we know from today, we know that it's harmful. So the use of tobacco injures health and defiles the body. Also, oops, wait a minute, where did it go? Where did my slide go? I thought I had another, oh, here we go. I'm sorry. Bible verse, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the, we talked about this earlier, you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. If these things are called an abomination and the temple is holy, would I take something that's a, that God calls an abomination and bring it to something holy? No, I wouldn't. Next point. Nicotine is an addictive substance. 
We become enslaved to it. Romans 6.16 in the easy-to-read version says this, Surely you know that you become the slaves of whatever you give yourselves to. Anything or anyone you follow will be your master. You can follow sin or you can obey God. Following sin brings spiritual death, but obeying God makes you right with him. So it's nice to compare this verse with Matthew 4.10. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So am I going to serve my desires, or am I going to serve God and what he desires? The next point, the tobacco habit is an unclean habit. And if we look here at 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. You know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's just hard for me to imagine a, a Christian that would chew tobacco or continue to smoke once we know what we know now. And I want to say this, these are difficult things to overcome. Overeating, I was very heavy for many years of my life. I mentioned earlier that my cholesterol was high. And through following the biblical diet, you know what one of my problems was? The crabs and the shrimp. They're loaded with cholesterol. Once I cut those things out of my diet, once I realized the biblical diet, I stopped. I stopped doing all of those things that had all those horrible things, and I came right off the cholesterol medicine. I haven't had to be on it for over 20 years now. It's amazing. It's amazing. God knows what's best for us. So these nicotine habits, the smoking habit, chewing tobacco, these things, they're addictive to us. Overeating, is an, it's an addiction. That what I put into my mouth, it can be an addiction. I love food. I love to eat. I love it. Next point. Number four, the use of tobacco, definitely, we know it shortens life. And that, that's not a secret at all. Some doctors say that smoking can shorten a lifespan by as much as 30%. And really, that breaks God, God's command about killing because we're, we're killing ourselves prematurely. And we shall not kill, according to Exodus 20, 13. Even though it's a slow death, it's still killing. And one of the best ways to postpone your funeral is to quit smoking tobacco if you do. And if you, it's a difficult thing. Pray about it. Make it a matter of prayer. We even have a couple of things that, uh, that we've put together that might help you to quit smoking. They give you ideas on how to quit and how to overcome those things. And sometimes even through diet, you can, you can beat the urge to want to have to pick up and smoke or, or chew tobacco. So these are things that we're all sinners, friends. We all have vices to overcome. Every single one of us, not one of us, is, doesn't have something that doesn't plague us somehow. Every one of us have that. And this is to help people to be able to see what God's Word says so that they can make a choice, make a choice for God's kingdom. Next question. What solemn reminder is given to those who ignore God's rules? Well, Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Those who break God's laws regarding our health care, about our health, about what we eat, about our body, about the rest that we need, all of those things, just as one abuses that car, if they abuse the car, they're in serious trouble. All of these things, if I reap bad things, I'm going to sow, or if I sow bad things, I'm going to reap bad things. I'm not going to plant corn and get potatoes right? I reap what I sow. And those who continue to break God's health laws, ultimately, we read, they're going to be destroyed. If we break God's law, we're going to be destroyed. And trouble comes when we ignore these things. And so let's take a look at the next question. We just have a couple more questions to answer. So here it says, what fearful, shocking truth about health involves our children uh, yeah, what fearful, shocking truth about health involves our children and grandchildren? You say, does it really? Well, in talking about eating things that God forbids, he says, Thou shalt not eat it, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee. In other words, 
some of the things that we pass on are, are hereditary based on the choices that we've made in diet and health. We can pass them on to our kids and they can pass them on to their kids. And we don't even think about that. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 says, For I, Jehovah, am your God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me. God makes it clear that children and grandchildren to the fourth generation might pay for the things that the parents have done. If we ignore his health rules, there are consequences. In fact, uh, Brother Ed and I were talking before, and he says, you know, mothers are told not to drink alcohol when they're pregnant because it hurts the child. Well, if you do and you pass that on to your child, then your child is born with a deformity. They might pass it on to their child. So this text holds true. The children and grandchildren can inherit those things. Sickly bodies. Next question. What more, feel, what more fearful, sobering fact does God's word reveal? Or well, regarding the kingdom of God, this is what Revelation says. Revelation 21, 27. Nothing unclean or anyone who does anything detestable and no one who tells lies will ever enter it. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will enter it. Nothing unclean. So if I'm putting something unclean into my body, doesn't that defile my body? Doesn't that make me unclean? You are what you eat. God says not to do these things. They're an abomination. Next, Ezekiel eleven twenty one. But those whose hearts delight in loathsome things and detestable practices, I will bring the consequences of their behavior crashing down on their head, declares the Lord God. Nothing unclean or defiling will be permitted in God's kingdom. Now, God created those animals to, to clean up the earth. They have a job to do. But they're not for us to consume. It's true. Choosing our own ways, if we choose what we want and we go against God's will, this is something detestable. And it can cost us our eternal life. Next question, what should every sincere Christian endeavor to do? Not later, but at once. What should we endeavor to do? Well, let's take a look at what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 7, 7 verse 1, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And then we have 1 John 3, 3. So all people who have, who have this confidence in Christ keep themselves pure as Christ is pure. You know, I want to stop there. I remember uh, Brother Rick one time was saying, you know, we have these holidays that people celebrate like Easter and Christmas, and they always have an Easter or Christmas ham. Well, these things are supposed to be centered around the life of Jesus, life or death of Jesus, and here they are doing something that Jesus would never do. They have ham at a celebration for Jesus? Really? Really? So all people who have confidence in Christ keep themselves pure as Christ is pure. Christ would never eat anything unclean. And if I'm a Christian, a follower of Christ, would I do that? No. Another verse, John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we need to bring our lives into alignment with God's commandments because we love him. These commandments are a protection his laws are protection. Remember, people like to say that the Mosaic law was done away with. We, we established today that the clean and unclean animals, people knew who they were all the way back as far as Genesis chapter 3. It was understood what was clean and what was unclean. This was clear. It was understood in Noah's day what was clean and what was unclean before those laws were, were ever written. And the reason God wrote those laws is because the Israelites were in captivity to Egypt, and he, had to, he wrote the commandments with his finger, and he had the laws dictated to Moses because they had to relearn. They had been in Babylon for four, or Egypt for 430 years, and because they were there for so long, they assimilated all of the beliefs and all of the customs of the Egyptians. So now God had to show them, this is what I expect. You know, even in, in Babylon, when Daniel and the three Hebrews were there, 
th those three Hebrews, they only ate vegetables. They didn't have the king's unclean meats, all of those things that he had. They stuck to the biblical diet. It's interesting. And they proved to be 10 times healthier, I think it said, than the other boys. 10 times healthier. So if we follow God's diet, we're always going to fare better no matter what. And let me say this. Suppose I'm wrong about all of this. Suppose I'm wrong. And suppose you're right. Well, if, if, if I'm wrong and, and you're right, if I'm right and you're wrong, then you're doomed, right? But if, if, if I'm, what I'm, the what I'm reading from the Bible, if, if I'm believing what it says and it's right and you're wrong, then you're doomed. But if you're wrong and I'm right, or if you're right and the Bible is wrong, well, my way is safer. What the Bible says is safer. I'm safer to do it the way God wants me to do it rather than take a chance and be lost for eternity. You know, I, I think about that from time to time. If, what if you're unsure? Well, if I'm unsure, let me err on the side of safety. You know, if you're ever unsure, do it for the side of safety. So... Another verse, just a couple more verses I want to share. James 4, 17, if you fail to do what you know is right, you are sinning. <laughs> if you know something is right and you don't do it, you're, you're actually sinning. So the next question, but I'm worried because some of my habits have bound me so tightly. I can't give this habit up. I can't stop overeating. I can't give up those foods that I love so much. This might be what you're thinking. Well, we have a promise in the Bible. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many things? All things. Whatever habit, whatever vice you have, whatever you're doing that's displeasing to God that you know is against his commandments, if you feel like you can't give it up, come to him in prayer. Ask him to help you. If you pray to God through his son Jesus, God will give us a new heart. And he will give us the power we need to break whatever that habit might be. Doesn't matter what the habit is. You can overcome it through the power that Christ gives you. We can't do it in ourselves. Also, Mark chapter 10, verse 27. It tells us, with God, all things are possible. Not some, not a few, not many, all. God is ready to help us break whatever shackles bind us whether it's smoking, whether it's drinking, whether it's carousing, whether it's not keeping the Sabbath, whether it's worshiping a false god, whether it's eating things he tells us not to eat, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the vice is. He will help us to overcome it. We have to overcome in order to be in his kingdom. He wants us to be free, free of sin, free of all of these things that are an abomination so that we can live in his kingdom, so that he can be with us forever. He didn't send Jesus so that we could continue sinning. He sent him to help us to overcome sin. So our worries, our bad habits, our nervous tensions, all these things will be gone if we do God's bidding. Just ask God in Jesus' name. So I believe this is our last question. What exciting promises are given about God's kingdom? I could not let this go because really, the whole purpose of this whole week is to point us back to God's word, to help us to see God's character, to know who he is, to realize what he's going to do, what happens when we die, to know that his spirit can dwell in us through his son, Jesus Christ, to know that, that his commandments are valid, to know that he has a day that he wants us to rest. He's trying to give us rest and we want to refuse it, to show us that we can live a better quality of life by doing those things and eating the way he wants us to live. So what promises do we have by doing those things? Well, Isaiah 33, 4, and the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. You will be healthier for doing the things that God tells you to do. Even in this world, you can be healthier. Next, Revelation 21, 4, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. You see, God's going to wipe away all of these things. We can live for eternity in his kingdom. Isaiah 40, 31, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The citizens of God's kingdom obey God's laws. If you're going to live in the city of Stanton, where we are now, you have to live by the laws of Stanton. 
And if you break those laws, you will suffer the consequent consequences. So I want to be in God's, I want to be a citizen of his kingdom. And if I am, then I will live to the point to where I'll be in that new world where there's no sickness, no death, no disease, no eyeglasses, no crutches, no canes, no hospitals, no locksmiths, no physical therapists, no surgeons, because we will be restored to the way God created Adam and Eve. We'll have the youth and vigor that we have and in the prime of our life, and we will have that for eternity. It's really beautiful, friends. So I really hope that you will listen to these things that the Bible says. This isn't what Mark says. We looked at it from the Bible. We looked at what God's Word says. He has a plan for us. He has a plan for you. He sent His Son for you. His Son set the example for all of us. And you can believe that Jesus kept the biblical diet. Nothing unclean would have went across his lips. And when he ate fish and honeycomb, you can believe that that fish had both fins and scales, guaranteed. Because Jesus could not have died for our sins if he was a sinner. And after he was resurrected, he wasn't going to start sinning at that point. So keep those things in mind. God cares about our diet. He cares about our health, and he gives us the best guide, which is right here, God's word.